On your green card, I'm going to invite you, if you want, to write these phrases on the back. After the sermon, we're going to have a reflective moment. Uh, we're going to show a music video, and you'll have a chance to sort of reflect on the scripture passage and the, uh, the sermon. And these are just a couple of phrases I thought might be helpful in the reflection. Um, you don't have to do it that way if you don't want to. You can just sit and enjoy the video if you want. It's Flyleaf. We've seen them before in worship. Um, they're actually coming to town if you're interested in going. They're going to be here July 11th over at Pops, um, if you like that. I will caution you, though, we have normally watched their acoustic sets in worship as reflective moments. That's not their normal mode of performing, and you will have a very different experience when they pull out the electrics and, and get loud. So, <laughs> But if you're interested in going there at Pops, uh, July 11th. So there's, there's that. Did you grow up with one of these in your house or your, yeah? Did you ever cut them open to see what was inside? That's a mess. That is a real mess. So as I was starting to wrestle with this text, I had the two images. I had this image and then this corresponding one of stretching because uh, Stretch Armstrong, while Stretch Armstrong stretches, it's more like I do these days very slowly and very slow to return to my normal shape. The other downside of Stretch Armstrong, and I don't know if your friends did this to you the first time I was introduced to uh, Mr. Armstrong, they said, go ahead and punch him. Yeah, he stretches, but you hit him and he's like a rock. That hurts. The other image, those that stretch regularly for fitness or otherwise, um, it is a renewing, relaxing exercise. Those are two trajectories that this text can go. And we see those two trajectories right off the bat with James and John going into the Samaritan town to prepare the way for Jesus. They're trying to set up lodging and food and, and things of that nature. And I won't get into the whole feud between the Israelites and the Samaritans. We'll save that for another day. But there was one, and Jesus and his crew are rejected. Now, I don't know about you, but when someone I love gets rejected, I feel very much like James and John, and bringing down the wrath of God, a little fire and brimstone, would feel pretty good. And that's what James and John suggested. And then Jesus rebukes them and has a different ethic. This is sort of a precursor to what we see in Luke 10, when Jesus sends out the 70 on their whole practice mission, their experiment in doing mission work. And he gives them very specific instructions. If you're trying to look at the gospel from a big point of view, we have that ethic of Jesus that if, if you try to save your life, you lose it. If you give up your life, you save it. That whole kind of ethic. What we see in today's text, what we see in Luke 10, put some flesh on that so it's not just some esoteric saying, but we actually see it put to use. So Jesus' ethic is uh, to love your neighbor regardless of the hospitality they offer or don't offer. Uh, in fact, if you read through Jesus' ministry, I never read Jesus getting mad when he's mistreated. Whether it's in the Passion at the end of his ministry, or at the beginning after his baptism when he's doing his first sermon in his home church, and they almost kill him. He does not get angry at those folks, but when he does get angry is when another of God's children is being oppressed, or when God's house is being mistreated. You remember the story with the whip coming through and cleaning out the money changers. Jesus is all about some righteous anger at that moment, but when Jesus is rejected, it's just not the way he reacts. So I want to invite you to ponder with me for a moment, because I think the real key to this text is the last half of what Tracy read for us. There's three encounters. Um, there's a, an offer to follow, an invitation to follow, and then an offer to follow. And those three encounters, I think, help us wrestle with what Jesus is driving at and what our ancestors are remembering of Jesus in this text. The other thing I would like to invite you to pair with that is Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, another three set uh, structured a little differently, but I think the three kind of pair up and help us to, to toss these ideas around. So the first offer to follow, uh, this, this person comes up to Jesus and says, I would like to follow you and I will follow you anywhere. Now, most of us in church world, Someone offers to do that. Someone comes up to Melanie and says, I will be willing to do vacation Bible school, whatever you need, wherever you need it, I will do that thing. I already see the smile on Melanie's face as she's anticipating someone stepping up to do that. Jesus does not respond that way. 
In fact, Jesus comes off a little cold and prickly. Jesus says, that's nice, but the wherever I go means that sometimes I may not have a place to lay my head down. The temptation that I think pairs with that is when uh, Satan in the wilderness asks Jesus, well, if you're all, all God's son, why don't you take this stone and turn it into a loaf of bread? It's the base needs of our life. If you're familiar with Abraham Maslow's work and his hierarchy of needs, uh, in essence, we have the one that offers to follow, is wanting to transcend his life, and he's offering to follow Jesus, and Jesus pushes him back down the hierarchy and says, that's all good and well, but following me may challenge your base needs, your shelter, your sustenance, your security. That's one way to look at it. Another way to look at what Jesus is saying to this fellow is maybe, if you follow me, you're going to have a completely different perspective on what it means to have those base concerns for yourself and your family. What it means to be anxious about your shelter, security, and sustenance will be radically different if you follow me. Maybe that's what Jesus is saying. That's a more warm fuzzy than you're going to be homeless. Right? The second... The follow me invitation. The response that Jesus gets is, I would love to do that, but I have to go home and bury my dad first. I paired that with the temptation to jump from the highest point. Satan takes Jesus up to this big pinnacle and says, if you're the son of God, just jump off because God loves you so much, God's going to surround you with angels and you will not get hurt. Now we've gone from the base needs of our life to now we're asking questions of life and death. The edges of our being. Instead of the core where we live every day, when's the next meal coming? Who's going to the grocery store? Who cleaned the house? Um, now we're talking about life and death. And again, Jesus comes off a little cold. Let the dead bury the dead? Really? <laughs> That's not... Not what I was expecting when I agreed to follow. Unless we start thinking about the way Jesus started this by rebuking James and John. Because I think Jesus comes off sounding very cold if I'm reading this from James and John's perspective, a perspective that if I don't do what Jesus says, the wrath of heaven is on my head. Now it feels about manipulation and coercion and a lot of pain, that whole fire and brimstone stuff. So, if we read it from Jesus' perspective at the start of this text, of loving our neighbor regardless of the hospitality they provide, maybe what Jesus is trying to say is that if you will follow me, your perspective on life and death issues will be radically different. We are talking about following the one that gave us the breath of life to begin with. And us, the reader on the other side of Easter, understand that we are following the one that paid such a price so that we would live forever. The one who is going to gather us all together around that big banquet table when our time comes. We're not following a stereotypical monarch we're following one that loves us. So the last, uh, the, the last piece of these three, we have the I follow you statement, followed by I will follow you after I go say goodbye to my family. I'll sign up, take my marching orders, but I need to get my affairs in order first. And Jesus' response to that person is, do you know what it's like to try and plow when you're looking backwards? It's kind of like driving a car when you're looking at the rear windshield, which works great when you're in reverse, but does not work well when you're in drive. If we, and so the, the, temp, the temptation that pairs with that is, the, uh, is Satan offering to let Jesus rule everything and Jesus will just bow down. And we know that you know, Satan's not really interested in Jesus ruling anything. He's more interested in the bowing down part because that's what chains Jesus. Looking to our past, 
can chain us. Jesus' imagery there of us looking backwards while we're trying to go forwards is allowing our past to chain us, not support us. Instead of becoming a foundation that we build upon, it becomes something that, well, it distresses us and it distracts us. Which really, I think, is where these three lead us. If we read it from the point of view of James and John and their whole angry retribution, or the tempter and his temptations, or our first read of Jesus sounding rather cold, Jesus is naming the things that so often distress and distract and ultimately destroy the relationships that we enjoy. Because what Jesus is ultimately saying is that Jesus wants to be the priority in your life even above the best relationships that you enjoy. And that if you will place God at that point in your life, then through a lot of hard work and some discipline, there may be some tough times, but ultimately, all of the rest of that stuff gets better. Everything gets better if you place God as the prime relationship in your life. As we get ready for the 4th of July and we think about freedom, this text then is all about us being set free. I just thought that was funny. It's all about us being set free through this relationship. Pairing the temptation to these invitations from Jesus, the temptations in the wilderness are all about chaining us and controlling us and coercing us, where Jesus' invitations and his response to those that accept are all about setting us free to truly enjoy the relationships that God intends for us. Linda tells a story of her daughter Lori's life. Uh, Linda's from over in Ohio, and they live a little north of Dayton. Lori was um, born, and there was some concern because there had been several children, and they were all closely spaced, and the doctor was worried about Linda's health, the mother's health. And so even the doctor may have been a little surprised when Lori was like three weeks overdue instead of being early preemie, as they all expected. Lori was always known to be not just a wonderful, lovely child, but a rather determined child. We might say willful. <laughs> Had a wonderful growing up in church, but her teen years were difficult, and Linda says that the Sunday after graduation, they got home from church to find Lori's room empty. She had moved out. No notice, no forwarding address, just gone. In addition to some frantic searching and phone calling, Linda said all she knew to do was to pray and to give Lori up to God. Lori then starts to help tell the story at this point and says that um, her moving back home, and she was gone a month, her moving back home was really when she had decided in her life that it was time to start trusting God more than trusting herself. I don't share a lot of details of what happened. I'm certain, as we might imagine, it was not pleasant. But what they wanted to share when they told the story when I heard it was that they had named God as the prime part of their life. And when they did that, it allowed them to reconcile with each other and to get back into healthier space. God is not laying this kind of expectation on us to chain us. God's done way too much work and invested way too much time in you to do that. This is truly about setting you free. We're going to enjoy a, a little reflection moment, and I'll let you um, ride as you wish. <laughs>